Uh, Godspeed to us all. I've hit record. We'll see. Godspeed, you recording, Emperor. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's been a lot better of a week. I'm Michelle Perez. Welcome to Working On It. I'm joined, as always, with my buddy Jake, my buddy Ruben, and my buddy Eliza Gager. Uh, today, uh, we're kind of expanding upon one of the original things we had originally spoken about as it relates to, well, work and self-employment specifically. For whatever reason, if you're in the DIY field, the freelancing field, or uh, any sort of business where you're going into business for yourself, that's usually not your first point of entry. Uh, myself, I have had more of a general labor background. I don't exactly fit the mold of someone that, you know, started out writing. For a lot of people in the writing field... They do maybe something through academia or, you know, their, their chosen profession after going uh, through college for that process. A lot of journalists. Uh, for, for me, my way into writing was who I knew and sort of where I posted. Uh, my, my first uh, freelance unpaid sort of work where we were doing a, a collective project was at medium difficulty. Uh, it was egged on by my friend Carl Perrin Kennings. And uh, I basically did an article slash column called Equip Wolf Shirt, Use Whiskey. Medium difficulty was a website where you'd see a lot of thoughtful posts. Uh, one in particular really helped them blow up, which was uh, about the connection between drone pilots and uh, the video games they enjoy. And lo and behold, uh, they had some pretty interesting things to say as it related to the inhibition to kill and distancing language and sort of dissociation as it relates to that. Uh, and video games at that time were sort of at the, at the mercy of and had been on the other way out of... Uh, litigation with Jack Thompson in Florida. And so there was this... Remember that guy? Remember Jack Thompson? Like, he was this very... He had, like, this sort of flared-up Ric Flair hair, very white, a Floridian evangelical who was very pro-Israel. I feel like we have not had a Jack Thompson since Jack Thompson. Well... Yeah, no, he's... he's... We, we don't have a cultural, like, boogeyman trying to scare people about the violence of a thing on TV anymore. Not at all. Uh, I think the nearest analog we saw recently was maybe after mass shooting after mass shooting, the Trump admin had, uh, had like, footage of Wolfenstein, the New Order, and you were just blasting Nazis in the face point blank in machine with machine guns and... I mean, if you were going to think of, like, a pathology you would want to map to a mass shooter, it's not the first thing that comes up when I think of right. just blowing a Nazi's head off of his body uh, in a very specific way. Um, but that was sort of like my immediate entry portal to to my au revoir, which I guess is, uh, which is writing specific... Uh, I don't know the best way to describe this, but uh, relating personal stories and anecdotes to a lower, larger overarching uh, idea within the work. Uh, we see this in the extreme now to the point where everyone is sort of inserting themselves to, to the subject matter they're focused on, sometimes to the detriment of the work. Uh, eh, but it's a coin flip. I think... I think it depends on the person uh, and the the deft use of uh, employing themes and ideas to people, and also 
having an editor, like a consistent, competent editor, which is all over the place now. But like in terms of in terms of that entry point, uh, nothing would really from my overall body of work. Uh, well, actually, maybe it would. It it's sure it's it certainly shaped like my mentalities and how I thought of people. Uh, just all of the odd jobs I've done, and I kind of wanted us all to kind of take a step back and kind of look at that, like what brought us to where we are now. What were the jobs that like we remember that brought us here, and like what does that look like for us? Uh, I kind of wanted to go round robin, and uh, I can probably go in on the way pre-writing work that actually brought me to writing, and the two coalesced in a weird way. Uh, Jake, I hate to put you on the spot, man, but... uh, No, I was going to cut in anyway. Hell yeah. It's an origin story up, everybody. That's what's Um, up. What Michelle is trying to say is that uh, we didn't have done to talk about today and we didn't have a guest lined up so we kind of wanted to go backwards a little bit and uh in the first up we talked a little bit about ourselves and our backgrounds but this is the episode where we will talk more about that because why are we all doing this podcast together in the first place um so that was kind of my pitch for today um Mm -hmm. to that end michelle you kind of started us off talking about a little bit about your writing and your history Um, But what I'm going to do first is kind of grill you uh, because you had a path that you, you, you said you, uh, you marked the beginning of it, which was Carl talking to you about medium difficulty and uh, getting you in roped into that. Um, The outcome of that or the final, not final, but, but the latest milestone along that way has been the pervert comic. You got published by image comics. You're Oh boy. uh, We know this. But, okay. but it is it is good to remind listeners. Fair enough. Um, so I, I think, you know, to the end that we're, we're doing origin stories, where I'm going to make you start. Um, fucker. I think it's interesting that you, you bring up Carl in the first place. You brought up where you posted. Uh, mm. Listeners of the podcast probably don't know. Um, yourself, Ruben, and me, which is uh, three out of four of us. Yeah. know each other from posting on the same message boards back in the day. This is also how we all know of Carl. Um, how was that experience for you, writing on message boards? Let's talk a little bit about that. Oh, okay. Uh, that was in high school, so... Oh, we were all in high school. Way, way back. Going on probably nearly 15 years now. We were in Discord together, and I was just showing all of the, like, fan warnings I had gotten over the years, and it's, like, a page long. Like, I've always never got banned on a technicality, which was nice, but... You have a million slaps on the wrist. The origin of me as a writer is... The origin of me as a poster, and going from being really bad at posting to just having a specific way of posting... Uh, we were on the PA message boards, the Petty Arcade message boards, which is yep, obviously right. laughable, but, uh, Listen, it's also, it was a different time. It's also the point of origin for not just me, but, uh, if you've played any, uh, large AAA games in the last few years, uh, you can basically look at a lot of the artists on that board, basically being mined from their, uh, whole cloth. I once sat in on a dinner before someone basically applied for a job at Steam and would later, some years later, go on to work at Naughty Dog. She's she's doing really well for herself right now. Yeah. Uh, like, there was I quite did, an interesting group of people on that. There, were, there are a lot of game developers from that board. Carl himself uh, would go on to be a writer on the game Matador, uh, which had a different name. I forget but Brigador Brigador. There it is. It was Matador. Then it became Brigador. And it's basically like a game with the lineage from the old EA strike series, uh, explosions, all of that good stuff. Wonderful music. And you also have Andrew Hussey, uh, the creator of Homestuck. 
Uh, yeah. Hussey, Hussey was a poster on our board. Hussey was a I poster him, from the boards. But I know uh, that. I Yeah, I don't know him either, but uh, you may may know him as uh, one of the one of the accidental progenitors of uh, the ISIS-style fervent fandom. Uh, yeah. Homestuck oh. people are are at least 78 types of guy. Or... As long as we're listing other other spin-offs, uh, Twitter star Cohen is a ghost, former Penny Arcade poster. Former Penny Arcade poster. Uh, in, terms, in terms of me, myself, a uh, little more humble. I mean, it is very good to be someone who got into writing at a very early point and then... Uh, like, within 10 years of that, actually get your first physical piece of printed media out there. Like, that's a feather in the hat. That's a really rare to do. I have no college to my name. I've mainly worked factory jobs. Uh, and it comes up in the comic, The Pervert. Uh, because it's like a... It's like a composite autobiography. It's not a one-to-one of my life in that specific time in Seattle I lived. But... Uh, it is about pretty much most of the jobs of my adult life as it went through my career in writing. Uh, so, like, the story of the pervert is the story of work. Uh, and it, it's a constant fixture in my head. Uh, even, even as I kind of grew in following on Twitter, uh, that following grew. Weirdly enough, around the time of Occupy Wall Street... And where I met a lot of the people on medium difficulty that would also go on to bigger and better things uh, beyond the sphere of the people that would appear on critical distance uh, would constantly be features on critical distance. And then you have the Oakland LGBT slash weird scene that fucking blew up at some point and like exploded violently. Uh, around that time, it it was a weird time to work, and I was a political cold caller. I basically would sit around and be miserable, take photos on my phone of said misery to the point where I... Carl said to me, "You need to you need to start actually writing. Write for me. Just write anything that pops into your head about video games." And so I would write the Equip Wolf Shirt Use Whiskey uh, column, and I would go through and basically write about convergence marketing, and I would try to just be very mean-spirited about trends in video gaming that I thought were dumb and stupid and mm -hmm. would be deeply angry and personalized <laughs> like stupid trends I had seen. I'd done one about uh, kill cam montages. This was like probably some of my worst writing, but some of my most formative writing where I would see people's responses. I'd get like 20 retweets because engagement uh, worked a lot differently and like sometimes a few hundred and I'd be like, ah. but uh, from there, it it uh, it sort of went to then, okay, I get out of the relationship I'm in, and that also went into the book. Uh, I would go back home. Um, I would work in a... Wait, wait, wait. No, 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 no. That time I did not. <laughs> I went directly to Washington State, uh, moved in with some people... I was friendly with, uh, from the boards, uh, I basically at some point or another would kind of go through the arc that led to me sort of coming out and transitioning and, uh, it, uh, it, it, it my writing and recognition got heavier when that happened because when it happened I basically came out in an article about the outing and subsequent uh, 
subsequent sort of dragging through the muck of the name of Chloe Seagal. Uh, she's no longer with us. I don't want to get too much into that, but that's... I, that's a, I wanted to ask one thing. I, yeah. I honestly didn't remember. You had... Did you use that... Did you use Equip Wolf shirt, use whiskey to come out publicly? Yep. Okay. Uh, that, all right. I... It was because obviously, it was, you know, I, I had kind of, I had kind of known about your transition before that, so I, I didn't, I didn't quite put that together. I don't think, but that is, uh, yeah, uh, that's pretty it's remarkable. Well, because the thing was, this is pre GamerGate, uh, and basically a lot of the players that existed around that point, uh, were just doing internet detective dipshit shit to kind of look at her claims at the time, to scrutinize her, to then refund a bunch of money uh, that was related to her transition-related care. And the thing is, at that time, this is not the, air quotes, affirming time we are in right now. Uh, so I wasn't trying to do culture war, but I was trying to shame people into treating someone like a human being. I had gotten a lot of positive responses, specifically from Chloe, and I kept in touch with her for a while. A lot of people can, you know, say you were just doing this to, you know, bring yourself up on the haunches of someone else, but Chloe and I were on good terms about it, and that's the only thing that matters to me. I don't give a fuck what anyone else thinks about it. I was just trying to, like, say, like, like that day I had basically been de denied my meds and was like, no, uh, you have to go through this specific process. And I did. And uh, I, I was working at a chemical plant at the time. Finally got a job. Uh, everything uh, is okay for a time. Uh, events basically within the work after I disclosed my status fucked up my shit big time uh, a lot of problems arise uh, I leave Seattle on not the best of terms uh, things go awry everything explodes uh, I, I throw myself back into my writing and I become friends with uh, Remy Boydell through a mutual artist I know, Francine Bridge, who has been my rock forever. Francine is, uh, you know, my one of my best friends. Big shout uh, outs to Francine. We do want to have her on the podcast. We're, we're going uh, to definitely have her on. Uh, yeah. And yeah, uh, Remy and I, we, we sort of online date for a bit. Uh, and we go through some pitches for Vice uh, on the subject matter of a, like a sort of furry uh, left of center com comic where uh, around that time a lot of people were trying to do new takes on cartooning. And now, who, was your, who was your first point of contact on that, out of curiosity? It was... Uh, Rachel, uh, I'm just going to use her first name. Yeah, no worries. Rachel introduced me to Francine. Francine. No, no, to, to the Vice, to the Vice gig. No. Oh, there was no gig. Uh, it was a pitch. There's a. Oh, so you were pitching. You were, you were all, you all were like cold. Remy, Vice, Remy basically. and I were pitching Vice. Uh, got it, got it, got it. Because okay, there was all. contact there. And. That's what I was curious about. It, the thing we got was that it's too wordy. Mm. Uh. And so at some point or another, uh, Brandon Graham and Emma Rios are running the anthology Island. Uh, and, uh, Jay Bearhead and, uh, AVB are running Zeal, a, a sort of comics slash media, uh, clearinghouse of sorts. And we run the first... Uh, pervert comic. The origin of the pervert is basically I had I had pitched three scripts to Remy. Well, no, four. Three of them got rejected. Uh, they were like 
of a fictionalized group of incidents with the characters I wanted to have involved. The one Remy wanted was me relating a real story, uh, albeit heavily edited, where I was doing survival sex work for food. For fast food at that. Uh, I... I kind of been through the ringer in Seattle in so many words. But uh, one thing that has always sort of um, done okay for me isn't when I write anything upbeat or happy or fun. Uh, people really respond to when I write something bleak or if I elucidate a point in a bleak way. Don't know why. Probably speaks to my influences Uh in writing. I mean, and, you have been threatening to violently kill people over the internet for quite some time. Well, beyond that, beyond that, I when I say that, it's like Duke Nukem stuff. I cannot actually do the I am trash man thing and kill 42 billion cops. That's fair. But it lets us, I think to me, well, I've known you for a long time, but I, I, tie, that, I tie that attitude into your other, your more nuanced darkness, shall we say. Well, I mean, life is... Life is uh, not without upbeat moments of joy and, like, genuine connection between people, but it's also uh, a series of events where you just sort of talk yourself out of committing too long to realizing how fucking terrible everyone treats one another uh, in passive ways and, like, in macro ways. Like, our whole political systems are predicated on uh playing a game of like santa claus is real and that like we don't uh do evil things every fucking day uh and i think plainly plainly kind of kind of illustrating that to someone sure it will come off bleak but i feel like it's stenography if anything uh and that everything that happens in the book happens every day to like other people. Uh, the common thread isn't that uh, everyone can necessarily see themselves in my story, but that I think everyone uh, has worked or, you know, if not like has a conception of the idea of work and that like work is something you put yourself into and Anything you put yourself into, uh, there's some of that shit that's never coming back. Um, like, I, I don't even, I don't even know if necessarily all of that can be attributed to sex work in the past. It, it dealt with uh, me doing survival sex work, and uh, having a range of feelings on that. Uh, I think the the outward perception of me as being a massively sex positive person and supportive of sex workers sort of, sort of view. Uh, I get it. I, I don't know if that's a hundred percent how I feel about everything. Uh, like I would never go to bat for the porn industry. I would never go to bat for, uh, a lot of the, uh, people, arguing anti-sex work rhetoric uh and i don't necessarily think it's great to think of it in moralist terms but that's like you know there's no succinct one sentence way to say that and it's become a big fucking uh method of argumentation for like uh for like the online air quotes contrarian types where it's like give me the wikipedia definition of this uh, okay, uh, here is the Wikipedia definition of suicide. Read it a few thousand times is how I feel about that fucking reductive mode of argumentation. Please, just right. read it until it manifests in your mind and in your soul. It, just become to encompass it with your entire being. But yeah, uh, yeah, and the pervert comes out, and at that point... Uh, things start to change. I go to Baltimore, uh, do a few writing gigs. Now, was this just the first strips of the pervert you're talking about? 
so the first strips would run an island. Sorry. Yeah, right. I, yeah I, I ran my an mind island. jump ahead. Yeah, I was just wondering about the how you guys went from doing the first strips to to the the full book. Well, the first strips were us being told, "Hey, we've got this amount of uh like work we can put in an island right now." Because it was 10 page strips. Uh, my idea with Remy was, okay, there's this comic I really like by Warren Ellis and Ben Temple Smith called Fell. The hook of Fell is you could come in and jump in at any point and know it was happening. And uh, they were self-contained, but if you read all of it, there would be connective tissue and threads linking all of them. And to me, I don't think everything should be Law and Order style, but wouldn't that be a great way to look at like a a life you don't examine too closely, but if you put the pieces of the whole together, uh, I thought it would be great for the medium of an anthology. And I wanted to write to the medium and use the strengths of Remy as an artist. Remy does uh, a mixture of watercolor, digital art, and, and like in our comic, we wanted to fit to a six panel uh, set up. We, we, we were going to try to do it like nine, nine panel watchman style, but we wanted to have our own sort of identity. So six panel cartooning and the progression and how it worked was basically, we wanted to keep those six panels so that whenever we did a splash, uh, page, which encompasses, you know, both pages, uh, it would be like a really, really crazy or illustrative moment, you know. We wanted to use everything for effect. Uh, and uh, Island, at some point, would be canceled. Uh, the scuttlebutt was that... I mean, I don't feel I'm oversharing or whatever. The scuttlebutt, or, air quotes, speculation, was that... Uh, it wasn't making as much money, but it didn't necessarily matter. I think it was that a unnamed big creator that makes some of the uh, decisions at Image uh, did not like Brandon for some reason. Don't know why. Uh, and that's not connected to anything related to Brandon, and that's nothing I'm speaking on. Uh, sure. But then, so Island goes to Island. put... Yeah, ends. But Brandon had basically secured a deal that the pervert uh, and its final uh, run that was not seen in Island would be put into a collection or, that we would call the, the pervert OGN, you know, the, the original graphic novel. And the pervert uh, basically basically is is a thing that happened in a very hard point in my life. I was living with my parents. I had been detransitioning on and off because I couldn't fucking afford my medication. I was maintaining a relationship with Remy that was on a downward fucking arc. Uh, and we broke up and finished the book together anyway. At the point where we broke up and we're finishing the book, uh, in a weird way, it it served the work. Uh, we we spoke, and I was like, "We're near like the end of this book. Uh, the color grading has like this specific quality, and it hits really hard. Uh, and there's always this sort of theme of fading to black or whatever. But instead, I would like you to change the way you do the coloring to have it go in, from darker." or from, from, from the colors to, like, having the colors more muted, grays and blues specifically. We want it to be a fade to blue. Uh, and the book, the book's ending uh, is something where whenever I've spoken to people about it, uh, they really, really like it. Uh, every, every, even, the, even the critics and the people... Uh, going on about it at like LA book fest where we were like, like the finalists in graphic novels. We fucking lost to big Tilly Walden. 
goddamn on a sunbeam, shaking my fist. No, uh, Tilly Walden, they deserve it. That's that not actually a knock. Uh, but was the thing that people kept saying, like, they were like, oh, we cried, we cried, uh, <laughs> over and over again. And I was like, well... I mean, I, I should hope so. Like, at that point, we were both fucking miserable. Uh, and that specific point in my life that we're depicting was also miserable and terrible and terrifying. And, uh, you know, the book is uh, also just brought, like, a lot of joy and happiness into my life. So it's like a wild contradiction the way those things work. I don't pretend to understand it. Uh, but... I think, yeah, yeah, that's like, that's, that's that now. I'm working on this. I'm working on, uh, working on the sequel to Michigan uh, after me and Remy briefly uh, reuniting for a bootleg sequel called The you Bronze. Said, you said the sequel to Michigan. I, uh, no, no, the sequel out. to The Pervert called Michigan. I apologize. There you go. Terry, you're just getting it straight for the listeners. Yeah. The pandemic has kind of fucked with that big time. One of the well, artists sure. on it straight up got COVID and some heart problems. So, like, we're all in weird places right now, but also kind of getting similar vibes in terms of uh, the place we're at and the work we've done. Uh sort of pouring itself into our work and sort of making us vessels for it. Which, yeah, in terms of my work, I, I've tried to recount stories of working in factories, stories of doing sex work, stories of uh, doing political cold calling work and being miserable. Uh, but yeah, it, it, it definitely is a, a focus for... Not like mythologizing work, but like, like, that's that that's where you spend most of your adult life, you know. It's inseparable. So I that's that's even why I want to do this. Like, I kind of want to see how that affects people personally, and then you know what they then take into what they create. Now the whole time for this last bit where I was being like uh, very very uh, long winded and heady I mean you know Ruben's you were, you knifing were, you were it taking up taking us on a trail yeah Ruben for the, for the listeners at home Ruben is using this spare time to sharpen his knives uh, definitely not a problem it's a whetstone yeah, I got yeah that is a nice right. setup I, I, I feel like <clears throat> I know I the... step up my knife <clears throat> I've been here the whole time. I've been muted. I ate dinner and then now I'm sharpening a knife. I was, uh, I know the history of Michelle. I was there for <laughs> the entirety of that. Yeah, topic. yeah, this is fair. So I was just getting, you know, everyone else caught up. Um, yeah, I was, I'm just sharpening my knife uh, on our little uh, convo cams here. I just bought a set, uh, a tri set of these are, I believe, Indian oil stones. So it's a non, this is a non friable uh, surface that oil stones are. It's a harder stone, whereas typically people think of wet stones or like they're, they're thinking about water stones, Japanese water stones. That is a friable surface. So that stone grinds away easily so that you have a non-flatter stone, but you have a more abrasive surface, but you're damaging the stone. And you usually have to flat those. So uh, Indian wet stones or just hard stones in general Mm. Typically a form of oral stone that's non-friable, so this doesn't really get damaged. Usually you wouldn't, this wouldn't go out of flat for years, really depending, uh, unless you're just really going to town on sharpening something every fucking day. Um, and there's a, there's a fun tri-holder that holds uh, three, all three grades, and you rotate that, and has a basin for oil under it. Uh, oh my God. Just going to town right now on that. Yeah. I'll try and do my whole kitchen by the time we're done here. What what kind of knife is that? Oh, this is my this is like a this is my general woodworking knife. This is called a Mora knife, M O R A. See if the world comes in here, Mora knife. So usually, <clears throat> I just use this for like just dicking around woodworking or like general use, like camping. Uh, it's not really a really good utility knife. It's a fixed blade with a rubber grip uh, in case it rains on you. Oh. <clears throat> um, but yeah, like if I want to carve a walking stick or or do something like that. Uh, Usually that's what I have this for. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm like 
fixated on this fucking no. knife. Yeah, everyone, just let's get like a good ten seconds. Of this knife. <laughs> I'm a quartz stone right now. I see the oil is loading a bit with metal shaving. I didn't even hear what the fuck you just said. <clears throat> I, can, I, can, I can hear it getting sharper. That's right. <laughs> uh, damn it. Well, Jake, let me turn the gun to you now. Yeah, that's fine. It's been a half hour. What I was going to ask is, uh, so... Are, I don't know if we can necessarily sync up our, uh, say, experiences one-to-one -one there, but you, I mean, how much of, how much of your personal life are you cool with sharing? Um, uh, enough, I suppose. Yeah, I was about to say, Jay, Jake and Ruben are the only two characters in our cast of, of adventurers that don't have oh, no. last name recognition for I mean, purpose. I mean, my last... No, it's not the worst. My last name is McCune. I just don't have any <gasps> to my name, so I don't mind just oh. by Jake. All right. Um, and, and, you know, I, I'm not a published anything. I'm not a paid author of anything. So, to me, um, for the purposes of promoting the podcast, being just Jake is fine. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, that said, um, yeah, that's, I mean, th what else about my personal life were you going to ask? Well, uh the experiences you had in a few industries, maybe in a tertiary way, as you've said, but I think are still uh, not interesting. Tertiary, it's just entry Ooh. level. Yeah, no, I've entry worked level. In, so, the thing is, is, I've never worked in. Um, I'm just, I, I, I'm 30 years old. I have done uh, a lot of a little. I have done a little bit of a lot of different things. That's the best way to put it. Um, which I really enjoy because yeah. I've kind of. I could kind of identify with you on that front. I may have yeah. been in many different factories, but they were all different disciplines. I'd been in molding injection, uh, regular old uh, day labor, all of that. Uh, but you, you had done that sort of thing, but across media, which yeah, I, was very I, interesting to me. I mean, so the, the long story short is I grew up pretty obsessed with television comic books um media at the time you know it's the it was the pop culture bubble that everyone else went through when the internet came out mm -hmm. um i happened to live in atlanta georgia so i was very specifically close to uh adult swim and turner so i knew that i i growing up i conceptualized that television gets made in these buildings that i drive by every day and that's where that's where some, like like i knew that there was a place i could go to work for like the tv basically that wasn't hollywood right or mm -hmm. New York City. Um, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. That was the other thing. I'm a, I'm like, here's my dirty secret. I hate working hard. I fucking hate it. Um, what? Yep. Don't like it. Don't like it one bit. Absolutely. Don't like, uh, I, I had a childhood where I wasn't, you know, like the only times I was really happy were when no one was telling me to do anything. Um, so that is how I grew up with the relationship to work. So when I when I was often asked, you know, as a kid, what do, what do you want to do when you grow up, et cetera, I was I was very much <laughs> I had no idea. Identified with uh, Peter from Office Space quite a bit. Oh my god. Uh, no, keep but, going. Uh, <laughs> but I knew I knew I just knew that like television would be a place I could end up, and um, you know, I grew up, uh, you know, fortunate enough to, to to go to go to school basically uh, across the country in Seattle. And when I moved from Atlanta to Seattle, I came out here, again, not really knowing exactly what I wanted to do. But what I had done was a lot of posting, joking around, and mm -hmm. writing-ish um, with you and Ruben and a couple others specifically online. So the whole time I, I was that dumb teenager who didn't know what he wanted to do, I was kind of sharpening my personality in other places. Um, and I was also really falling in love with a lot of extreme. Mm -hmm. Fun thing about a lot of that stuff, um, it's made by people that have to work regular ass jobs and don't make any money off their music. So as I was getting into the larger, uh, as I, basically as I was as I was falling in love with a bunch of music, I was also learning a lot about um, how DIY labels operate, how DIY bands operate. 
because I was quite interested in, in, in these people. I was quite interested in these artists. Um, the same is true of comic books. I graduated, essentially, well, the loose term, but from uh, being a weeb who was into manga to being a typical Western Wednesday new comic day comic book fan to then being a guy who only wants to read, like, independently published, yeah, like, sad core shit. Just, just as um, an aside. Or, or, yeah. Just as an aside, this was sort of how me and you had become friends initially. We both Absolutely. Were, we both were... At one point or another, regular readers of superhero comics. That yeah, shit, we that shit on took the message board that we me met at some point, but <laughs> that was the thing we probably talked about the most was that we were on the comic book section of that message board, uh, mm-hmm. chatting it up. And I remember at one point, you know, this was pre everything. We had talked a little bit about starting a comics writing blog that never really came to fruition. Um, it was me, you, and, and yeah, with AJ and also with Zoe. Um, yeah. Zoe, Which, who, who now magically is also writes about trans, comic books. and yeah. she writes at a site I contributed to a few times. Women write about comics. Absolutely. Uh, read read Zoe's work; she's wonderful. Uh, so even as far back as that, there was this idea that oh, I could maybe do some writing. Mm-hmm. Um, it was the only thing I was ever good at in high school too. Like the only thing that I could do kind of effortlessly and still get good grades on. Um, yeah. So moving out here. Um, you know, around the same time you started doing the Quip Wolf shirt, use whiskey. I had just started writing for my um, my college's paper, Seattle University's newspaper. I had also started making contacts with people who did a local zine around here called the Seattle Passive Aggressive. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, my writing career was basically doing a lot of, of media coverage, media blog style coverage. This was also the blog era. So like every day in college, I was reading Pitchfork, Stereo Gum, you know, uh, what is it called? IO8, freaking Gizmodo, all these blogs that had just, you know, little puff pieces or, or sometimes occasionally actually interesting material. You were a big, um, you were a big consumer of debt piff. Yeah, a little bit, yeah. Oh my God, uh, passion, really? Passion, I was of, the, just passion fucking... of the Weiss. Well, Dat Piff is a place you just go to get mixtapes. I read Passion but, of the Weiss, too. I, I remember well, Passion still going. of the Weiss is pretty good. First of all, shout out to them. Jeff Weiss is, is a real, real ass writer in yeah, the, the media ducked, music he, world. He, he ducked out of LA Weekly because all of the weeklies yeah. are being bought out by right wing libertarians now. Which and is he's done awesome. a great he's done a he's done a great amount of work exposing that at the boycott LA Weekly stuff. Uh, Passion yeah. of the Weiss, I just want to mention for listeners, if you like hip hop, that is a still active music blog that does very good and in-depth uh, mostly hip-hop coverage that is uh, patreon supported it's uh, patreon that's my, supported that's a personal shout out there they are guys that are fucking obnoxious about wu-tang but i saw jeff weiss in an airport once and mm-hmm. i couldn't say hi to him because we were apart from one another in security but i tweeted and he got back to me and was like yes i was in atlanta <laughs> he does not look like biz Marquee. i no. cannot stress this enough on Twitter, his name is Otto von Bismarcky, and his signature is having people assume he is Bismarcky. He is not. It is, he's uh, not. He's not. It's a joke. Car, just, Car, a twi- just a Twitter Carl joke. Carl Bayer is not uh, Alan Iverson, and Jeff Except Weiss is not Bismarcky. So, anyways, um, at around the time you were doing your Equip Wolf shirt, use whiskey stuff, I was also doing writing that was, I don't know, like, I... I I was kind of learning that, that although it could be fun for me to do a little bit of um, writing, I wasn't super interested in what I was actually writing, what I was actually doing. I was very interested in what I was writing about, um, but the most I ever got out of it was interviewing people. So I actually quite enjoyed, I, I did a couple of different, I did a lot of band interviews, mm-hmm. uh, more than a handful of band interviews for people. And that was always very fun, just being able to pick people's minds in real time and uh, kind of go through the, to transcribe and then pick the the actually good parts and present that into the interview um and you know edit that into something that was not just all of us blabbing for for two hours kind of like a podcast um and then over the course of doing that i was in college and i was still trying to aim towards some sort of television stuff and I, i i knew about turner so i knew about turner i knew it was in my hometown I knew that if I shot for an internship at Adult Swim, it would be very easy for me to literally live at home and drive there. I had also had the advantage of uh, just talking to people, turns out. So Adult Swim used to run local events at a convention called Dragon Con, 
they oh used to have a very fun panel where quite literally staff members from the television station would go on panel, talk about the upcoming stuff they had for Adult Swim that was coming out. And after one of those one year, I, I, I walked up to a woman because um, I didn't want to ask a question about it at the panel. I think that was my first idea was, oh, I'll go ask a question about being an internship. Maybe I did. I can't remember. But essentially, I asked someone after the panel and they said, oh, you should talk to this woman. And her name was Vanessa. And I went and talked to her and she was the woman who ran the she was in charge of the internships. So when it came time to actually apply, I also had an email that I had gotten from literally just saying hi to this woman at a, at a panel. Talk to people, folks. It really can help is, is a big lesson. Yeah. Story here. Yeah. Um, you know, just like put a little thought into who you try to who you need to talk to. And uh, like I said, I, I asked someone who was who, who did not know what to do, but they pointed me at, at this woman and said, if you want to be an intern, talk to her. Mm. And I said, I want to be an intern. She said, you're in college. And at the time I said, like, <laughs> no, or like, oh, no, I was not. I was, you had to be a junior. So she was like, mm. you a junior in college? I was like, no. She was like, well, here's my email. You know, hit me up when you are. I did that. I applied and I was an intern at Adult Swim for a summer in 2011. Uh, that was my first gig in television. I was I had no real great concept of how television worked before then um yeah nothing in my life had really opened up that door for me at, at that point um so that was a really cool and interesting experience you know i spent a summer sitting in an office doing a bunch of really random things i mean it was an internship it wasn't just getting coffee though i i, I let's see i had to shepherd around the people that were in charge of um a robot chicken for a hot second for like a couple days like in my car i had seth green in my car for a little bit <laughs> uh, i played ping pong against seth green that same week uh i only played ping pong with him because i had to move a ping pong table from our offices into the head of adult swim at the times apartment for a party that they was throwing mm. um so i had to like do literal phys- you know physical labor um so you were kind and- of in a in an in an impolite way here, uh, you're kind of oh, a beer runner. Oh, <laughs> no. In ways. All interns are. I mean, yeah. you're a beer runner, but the thing is, in television, the beer run is, is kind of a bunch of shit. Like, I did yeah. do coffee runs, quite literally. But I also acted in a bear suit for some interstitial material we had to do for Comic-Con that they, nice. like, went and filmed behind the building. Um, and then, you know, in between that, it was learning a lot about oh, how does this actual thing I, I want to be involved with come together? What does television actually look like on the inside? What are the guts of television? And, you know, the boring answer is it's offices, and it's people sitting in offices and emailing each other. And, you know, in between that, you have the actual, the, the cool work, too, which is productions and, and even post-production, which is people sitting in offices full of bigger computers um, and not emailing but clicking on editing tools. Um and within all of that, I just got to learn, oh, this is how TV works. Um, and, you know, I, it was a great gig. I loved it. I, I'm still friends with a lot of people that worked there. But going out of it, I still didn't have an idea of what I wanted to be. Other than a producer, which at the time, it was really funny of me to think that because a, a thing you kind of need to understand about television producers is that they are, you know, uh, this isn't a, this is, this is a, this is a generalization. Um, they are workaholics i think it's a part i think you kind of have to be, to be uh, i i i <laughs> you knew the scene and the place i'd lived previously right uh, where Florida. i was in yeah. seattle one of the iterations yeah yeah, 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 yeah. pre-transition yeah. i've met i think the different version of that that i've seen was video game producers sure and i, I know less about that. i've i've never met a video game producer that i you know didn't think deserved you know, I'm a firm believer in prison abolition with some exceptions and like Right. Maybe there could be like a gulag specifically for video game producers. Uh just <laughs> as an aside, like Yeah, it's it's you know some of like, the most I, gormless I, motherfuckers on the planet. But I do I that, <laughs> sorry, that tangent wise, in terms of T V production, uh in terms of being a workaholic it does seem to be a bit of a contrast to like some of those, yeah. those, uh, those feelings you've you've spoken of. Like I, I fucking hate work, but at the same time, yeah. Like a lot of what I did, a lot mm-hmm. of what I learned working in television, and later on, 
you know, I, I, I had a couple of gigs after an internship. It was a paid internship. I want to know. Shout out to the state of Georgia. Hell yeah. Um, I, they, did, they did have to pay me minimum wage. Um, but out of that, I was also able to um, make some contacts and apply to intern at the Olympics the summer following summer. Mm. Um, that was a much interesting and much more interesting. Well, not much more interesting. Much more. Um, what am I trying to say? I learned a lot the more stakes, there. I also the had a lot are, less fun. The stakes are a I, lot different learned, at the fucking yeah, Olympics. Yeah, I learned way more working for NBC, and I and I ended up working there as a as an intern in 2012 and on contract as an actual associate producer in 2014. Hell yeah! I'm in, I am in the credits of the NBC Sochi Olympics. That's it. That's like one of my in, in a couple Squidbillies episodes. That's that's what I got to my name. Hell yeah! Um, like a handful of of Squidbillies. So yeah, I I was in London 2012, depressed out of my mind, learning how to work on live television, learning how to edit. Um, finally, kind of like like actually learning how to just very simply edit stuff, but mostly learning um, that this is a, a industry that as fascinating as I find it, as much respect as I have for the people that work within it. It just fucking stresses me out, you know. Mm -hmm. um, it was it was it was so interesting to kind of you know be able to be fulfilled by my work, but also like, well, specifically with the with the case of working at NBC, I'll be flat. I don't like the Olympics, you know. I was taking the opportunity because it was an opportunity. I was young. Um, I certainly like broadcast coverage, so that that interest that always interested me, like learning from that angle. But you know, working for that institution working around a bunch of people that kind of didn't understand how much that shit sucks <laughs> was not my favorite um everyone at nbc very nice of course um but yeah i i came out of all of that living back in seattle and knowing that okay you just worked for the olympics you moved back to seattle you're probably not going to continue to work in television unless you do something different um and i ended up staying here not continuing to not work in television because at that point I had kind of figured out like this isn't really I don't want to be a producer it will drive me insane mm. um ironically after a year or two of cooking what are you actually talking about oh coming back to Seattle and realizing I probably don't want to move to LA to become <laughs> someone who works hard in Hollywood yes yeah uh, uh, uh four three two <laughs> okay four three two one and you were talking about production being yeah, a it's... producer and not wanting to be a producer. Yeah, that's fine. I mean, uh, I just got to fuck with this. I was just fucking with the mic settings. Um, so I had gotten back from Seattle. or I had gotten back from Sochi uh, in 2014. I was living in Seattle um, in an apartment with a buddy. And I knew kind of like, oh, like, you just finished the most biggest, the most biggest, the largest like television gig you have secured thus far in your very short career. Um, you don't have anything like, so the other thing is that like, there was, um, what's the, what's the, oh, I left out a part, uh, before I worked for the, the Olympics in 2014, I had, um, tried to apply, I had applied to a job at Adult Swim and gotten to the final round of interviews and then not gotten said job. That was kind of a big thing for me. That sucked ass, um, straight up. Uh, you know, that was the whole, what if your dream doesn't work out scenario? It literally did not work out for me. Um, you know, in, in hindsight, not, not the biggest deal. In the world. I was going to say, at, at even, the time, then, even oh, then, yeah. if you, if you had gotten an associate producer job at Sochi, right. it wouldn't have been a shut door if you wanted to try again in the future. Exactly. The and I, and, and at that point I kind of had that in front of me. It was like, do you want to try again? Um, at that point in time, trying again really just didn't happen um i kind of i kind of had a, sh a short window in which to apply to the same position one more time and it would have involved uplifting a uh, part of my life i had just established which was a relationship etc the cards didn't line up and what i was left with in seattle was um what the hell else what am i going to start doing now so we went back to working essentially you know uh uh, uh regular gigs labor gigs um Prior to being the television person, you know, just out of college, the other stuff I had done was working at a kitchen at a summer camp and a kitchen at a hot dog place um, and a snack shack, you know, way back when I was a teenager. Um, 
in like high school. So I had, you know, all I had was that kind of retail foodish experience and then also behind the kitchen experience. Um, cooked for a large number of people at a summer camp, et cetera. What did I do right after Sochi? Oh yeah. So then, so then once we get into the bad labor gigs, it's just working for the Museum of Pop Culture in Seattle, working for Amazon.com um, as a seller support person. So that was that's like customer support, but slightly more elevated because you're talking to the people that sell on Amazon. I did escalations in that category, so I just got yelled at by people for money. Not actually that difficult. Weird. Got yelled at. Got yelled at by people stuff. for free my entire life. So. Mm-hmm. Um, Getting paid to do it was kind of a niche for me. Uh, yeah. That's also why it works really well in production with producers. Um, you, if you are a producer, you will have to yell at people. This is inevitable. Another thing I learned, another thing I don't like doing. Um, I don't care how nice you are. This is just the nature of, of, of herding cats, which is largely what your job is as a producer. You're in charge of the cats, and if one of them goes missing, you're the one that has to answer for it. Um, so, you know, coming out of that, I got fired from Amazon, big badge of honor. Just Hell didn't yeah. like my job enough to conform to their standards, basically. In a short, look, long story short, I didn't follow the rules. They fired me. Um, and uh, after that was really the big, like, I don't really know what I'm doing in my life. You know, I, I, I had, this whole time I had been doing this kind of um, the, the, the low-key uh, music writing. That's a, that was a big on and off thing um, with the Seattle Passive Aggressive uh shout outs to them a little bit during that period i i did run a weekly um ser- a weekly column series for local shows like what local shows should you hit up uh back when that was a thing <laughs> fortunately not as much these days um and then kind of where i'm at now is the past few years i had gotten i had used my production experience and my previous kitchen experience um to secure a gig at a startup this startup was producing broadcast internet broadcast content in an educational capacity with out of a studio in Seattle. So I just had all of that shit lined up in my resume. Like I, I really just, you know, I fit right. I got that job pretty easily and then ingratiated myself into there. Um, and, uh, I kind of worked my way into that company for a few years doing literally a bunch of different crap and then ending up being, uh, part of their customer support team. So I piggybacked mm. both my production experience, my Amazon seller support experience, and all of my cooking experience into um, a job where I kind of got paid to uh, do my own work and everyone left me alone. And it was great. It was a nice gig. I got laid off in the COVID times just recently. And what I'm doing now that is not related to this podcast much at all, although it'll probably become related as I go to school, is uh, going back to school to be a therapist. Oh. Um, that's where I've ended up with all this, folks, is that despite having a, a large respect for artists and people who do work um, in that capacity to kind of really pour themselves into it, I'm just not, I just don't have that. That's not really necessarily where my, my calling has ended up. What I really like doing is talking to people um, mm-hmm. and then getting to know them and getting to understand them in a capacity that helps them, Ooh. you know, um, in a capacity that, that lets them bounce shit off of me um and that is kind of how i've ended up that is kind of a through line in all of my gigs anyway yeah um, customer service etc even in production like you're you, that is a people pleasing gig like if i'm a pa my job is literally to be the nicest guy i can to everyone i work with because i'm the bitch so i have to be um i mean so, it, is, it is wild though like uh a lot of people think of it as sort of a situation where it is like a straight line. For me, uh, it, this is the one thing I'm good at. Uh, right. Whereas going into a factory or this or that is going to incur much different experiences slash also just, you know... Levels of material reality that I have to look at. Uh, right. For you, for you, it's kind of like uh, you you got to like literally take a run at your dreams and like sometimes you don't actually after you've put enough time into it. Yeah, uh, you don't necessarily. Would you feel like if you had? If you are weren't like trying to go into therapy or whatever, 
mm. if you would like went more at television production would you feel like you like ended up doing it versus like getting in there you know i mean i I spent a lot of time thinking about because when i didn't get the job at adult swim it was like it was a big deal they i literally got like strung out for like three months it was a shitty experience like i they was they weren't just like hey you didn't get the job sorry it was like i had to find out by asking my friend who worked there who was like oh the new people are starting already and at that point no one had gotten back to me so it was pretty fucked up um and it left a bad taste in my mouth. R.E. Turner more than Adult Swim, you know, as an industry, as a as an organization, because no one who I knew who worked there had anything to do with me getting hired. Um, but I did think about it a lot, obviously. Um, and you know, at the end of the day, it was like I was during during uh, you know a note I should make during all of this from a good chunk of two thousand and. 11 when I started when my when I got the adult swim internship to you know right up to 2014 when I stopped working at Sochi um I was just hell I was mega depressed through a lot of that I was seeing a therapist I was working through a bunch of shit with my with my mother I was largely not a categorically happy person um I didn't really understand (laughs) what it meant to be a happy person I don't think at that time they you know in retrospect um so, I don't know. I just feel like I just didn't even have the capacity to really succeed in the way I wanted to at that point in time back then. It would have required a, a mindset that I wasn't capable of achieving, which was like, believe in yourself, you dipshit. Because um, I just didn't at the time. Uh, I think that really affected my, you know, just my run at, at, at working there in the first place. Um, but... Uh, I also think now knowing what I know about just myself and working in TV and frankly still talking to my friends that have worked in television, I probably would have gotten burnt out. I probably would not have enjoyed. I think I think to some degree I could have I, the the other the only other option is I would have fallen into it real hard and I would have become the type of person I kind of don't like to be around, <laughs> which is like a workaholic type person um who kind of puts you know, essentially puts their job in front of anything else that they that they like in life. And and let me tell you, I'm a guy that likes playing video games. You know, I don't like <laughs> I like having I like having my my me time and my free time. Um and you know, frankly what that meant having made a lot of the decisions I made was working uh boring ass 9 to 5 gigs that I could find. Um, or even less like, you know, like kitchen gigs are, are not always nine to five, but they do facilitate a schedule where you have off time and you can fucking fuck around and you usually have a little money to spend as well. Um, and those are the types of jobs I tended to work after my, after working in TV, Mm. um, really low effort, low mental maintenance. And during that time, I will point out, I have also, I was doing therapy. I was becoming a less depressed person. Yeah. I was growing, et cetera. Um, but yeah, that, that was, you know, I, I respect the shit out of people that work in TV. I love it as an industry. I I think it's one of the things TV and film, you know, to a lesser degree, this kind of stuff in internet production, it's just, you know, it's one of those, it only exists by the effort of a bunch of people. There's no one person in that, that, that gets all the credit. And that's the stuff I love about it. That's what led me to love it in the first place. Mm-hmm. Um, but the, the, yeah, the mechanics of it are, are, are crazy. You know, they're not. They're not crazy. They're quite defined in a lot of ways, but they are large, and and you have to work within them. And um, and I didn't fall into a trade either. Like I just didn't, you know, I wasn't like I want to be an editor or I want to be a cameraman. I was just like I want to work in television, specifically mm-hmm. for one animation, you know, like for one one animation brand, basically. Mm-hmm. And my other, and like when I go to work for other people at places of television. That's not what I want to do. So it was just a very quick, you know, it was like a, a um, uh, cutting away what I didn't like and finding what was left was basically like, hey, you like being around these people and helping them out and talking to them. And, and in general, you know, being a, a contributor. But yeah, I don't, I don't want to be in charge of anything. I don't want to be responsible for anything in television. That's a lot. That's a lot of stress. <laughs> and, 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 you know, when I talk to my friends that still work in television, that is still the case I get. They're they're heroes, they're champs, but they're always saying work's a bitch. <laughs> yeah, that's um that's the that's the thing. It's it's like, yeah, we we don't have a lot of experience uh overlap between the two of us, but uh 
I do think they're like become there. There is a time uh, for me. I have no college to my name. I'm actually looking into college right now. I'm probably gonna stick with the podcast and uh, still work on Michigan and like work on another thing. But like right now, uh, the 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 whole thing of it where I, I relate to what you're saying is like committing to a certain path in a certain way will uh like take a toll uh right. and i think yeah seeing what you actually value uh and where it will will sort of take you is is something that you're not going to have it just immediately click unless i don't know you're like a virtuoso and then right a lot of times for some people like that, they're not necessarily a virtuoso. This mean, come from massive amounts of inherited wealth, et cetera. And, yeah, you know. I mean, that's another thing I've learned. And, you know, it's like it. Like, nepotism exists everywhere, but exactly. um, it is it is a it is the name of the game in a lot of industries like television. If it's not ne- uh, if it's not nepotism, it's access. It yeah, was the yeah. guy you I mean, knew. absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And to some degree, you know, access can be uh I don't I mean, what's the word? You know, like I didn't know anyone at Adult Swim till I literally talked to someone in a room. But I had to be fortunate enough to attend that panel at that Dragon Con that year, right? Yeah. Um I mean, there's, so like, there's a lot of stuff goes into it. Yeah, there's um, net, there's networking which Right fine that's like yeah. you your that's, homies that's just cetera. talking to people right um but yeah the mm-hmm. the level of of um kind of like i'm fairly certain like you know like i'm i i wouldn't be surprised if it played a role in me not getting a job I, that's you know i don't want to go too <laughs> bad yeah <laughs> no no it's fine uh but yeah, it's 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 an industry where like I feel like I also be forced to work with a lot of people I don't like. Eh. Um, uh, yeah. Long story short, folks, the the further left you go, the 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 probably the less likely you'll work in Hollywood. <laughs> no, definitely. It's uh, I can I could say firsthand experience. Uh, I mean, you can you can turn it into a weapon, but that that's only by virtue of what specific thing you do. Mm-hmm. And uh, I guess who it bothers and uh, the value assigned to you doing bother. I, I'm not going to make my life a revolving door about talking about this stuff of the past. But, like, uh, it was nice where Image didn't necessarily say fuck you to the detractors, but said uh, we wouldn't really be Image if we weren't, like, uh, just showing, you know, everyone here, you know, we're, they, this person is not like an actual employee. There's someone we publish right. and like, we're not in the business of telling someone we publish how to think or feel, which is great. Uh, but yeah, no, the doors will shut. Uh, I, I had a lot of a lot of big name stuff that uh, could have went through until someone Googled me for like five seconds. Right. Which is like, I'm okay with that. If I want to keep continue doing what I want to do on the terms I want to, I, I'm i going to keep at it. Even if I have to go to alternative venues and I'm going to sit around fucking crying about it all day mm-hmm. or, or, you know... And if it doesn't turn work out, it doesn't work out. My my life is not going to be a series of uh, of uh, self lionizing, bitching statements, uh, or making everything culture war. Uh, I feel I feel good about uh, the scripts I've I've been working on for Michigan, and we'll. Uh, present it to image when I'm when we have like everything all together and it's gonna take time now, but I don't know. Uh, it the access culture is wild and it's changing and the sands are shifting under everyone, and it's gonna be interesting seeing what even blogging and traditional media looks like. We might not have Adult Swim in five years. 
Jake? Yeah, no, I've I you 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 don't have to tell me. Um, I am a prophet. I am uh something like a television and pop culture stupid Nostradamus. Um, mm-hmm. I'm always right. I'm just gonna put that all all on the record right now. You don't have to tell me twice. Uh, the moment that company Turner got bought by AT and T, uh, coupled with the immense success of Rick and Morty, and then throupled with the guy who was the president of Adult Swim retiring, uh, has brewed up a storm. And the conclusion of that storm will probably be something like it's just a section of HBO Max five years from now. Oh yeah, I, I hate uh, to say cartoon it. Cartoon Network. Cartoon but Network, I think, will endure. Cable isn't getting more successful, you know? Mm-mm. It's just not, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, the programming is successful, but the platform is failing. Yeah. So, yeah, we just might not have, you know, kids growing up these days. I mean, most not even kids. People watch plenty of Adult Swim television shows. Do not know they are Adult Swim television shows. The same is true of any other network, any television network. People didn't know Breaking Bad was an AMC show, for Christ's sakes, you know? Holy so, shit, yeah. That's just how it works these days. That's just the and it's, and it's sad to me. It's another reason why I don't feel so bad not really trying to work in television or media right now. Like, the landscape has quite literally changed from the moment in time when it was a dream of mine. Yeah, uh, and it's weird. Like, television is sort of technically the better way to view something insofar right. as you won't have to worry about latency. Uh, <laughs> the You could still watch it in 4K. Uh, very... I mean, hey, like, I love playing media off of something local or something that's not streaming to me, you know? Like, you don't have to tell me twice, but, like... Well, yeah, but it, that's... It's just messed that's, up, yeah. That, that's, that's the way it's all going, and... Uh... Everyone would like to believe that, like, doing things in this way for this flat rate would be great. But, like, you look at how many streaming services and then premium versions of that streaming service exist. Yeah. And it's like, if you looked at that versus a traditional television package, like, a traditional (laughs) television package is the cheaper choice, even with all of the extras now. And to be quite honest, it's insane. this is this is like a little bit of a side, but it, it relates to what I was talking about. Re, Adult Swim, Cartoon Network, anything. You know, I grew up in a in a in a, in a, a generation of people that will identify with uh, what what I what can only be described as just interstitial content, right? Like those mm-hmm. two Nami little in betweens, the little things with Tom, the, the 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 game reviews, the the just the cool edited you know together like montages and stuff. Connective that did, tissue that didn't that didn't exist. Th- those aren't the television shows, you know. That's not that's that's n- technically new media that they made as a kind of housing for for this programming. And the very concept that you have to have a house for your programming, that you have to present this kind of aesthetic around your programming, um, just doesn't exist, right? Like there aren't Adult Swim bumps on Netflix, so it's a bummer to me that. This stuff that I grew up being very important to me and kind of just like I was like, oh, this is this is what I want to be involved in. Like like just that that sense of the connective tissue or the behind the scenes. It almost just matters less these days um, in a way that I, I don't mean any disrespect to the people that work on it. Quite a, quite the opposite. Um, mm. uh, it, it, it just is an unfortunate turn that follows the technology, like the technology arc that we've had, <laughs> like just where we're at with oh. with devices and how people yeah. like to watch shit. No one can oh. control that, really. There's no, there's no grand architect of that. Uh, um, there I mean, is, to there some is, degree. but there yeah, is, yeah, but yeah. Uh, the thing, um, the thing, the thing that I always come back to uh, is death. Uh, and great thing about uh, everyone deciding to have the same idea at the same fucking time uh, is that they don't think it's stupid uh, when there's like. And they think of all all of this bandwidth and stuff as like being infinite, right. and all of the 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 storage the, the the storage somewhere else that then sends that signal that puts the thing for you to pig out on in your home. Right. Uh, we sort of think of it as infinite, and there's bit rot for that. There's bit rot for everything. Uh, having less physical versions of that that can then be used for archival and then extending the life of this thing across time and like right. doing it a bunch of times uh, is sort of an afterthought now. And 
they will literally shoot themselves in the foot if like the om like like if they only have digital versions of this content. What happens if there's catastrophic server loss for right, a bunch yeah. of these places? You could have whole streaming shows. I <laughs> mean, they, I they know people that to... are. I have known people that have worked in archival. <clears throat> it's a big part of that industry, and even these archives, which used to be on tapes, are being moved to all digital. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what the answer is as far as backups or re like when we have a digital archive. If that goes down, how do we access anything? You know, um, it's a very it would be copy. Blah, blah. It would basically Question. be copy to copy. Uh, it would have then, to be. You would have to have be refining. Multiple, well, you would have to have basically. You'd have to have multiple physical drives with storing all this data somewhere. And if you weren't able to electronically access them, you would have to be able to at least uh, take that physical drive media and put it, bring it somewhere else to to try and get get into yeah. it. Right. And right now, where is uh, where people... is the old the old archive room of a television station or whatever? is literally just rows and rows and rows of library shelves that you mm -hmm. can roll together so they, they can make more space. And it's just tapes, baby. Just tapes, 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 XD cams, CDs, physical media, everything, right? It all has to be on somewhere physical. Mm -hmm. um, that's a total aside, but, um, yeah. But yeah like, archiving and television is mm -hmm. pretty cool. That's, like, that could, that's somewhere I could have seen myself working at, maybe. Yeah, um, that, that's, that's, that's the thing. Like, everyone... Everyone uh, kind of wants to 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 have it all and have these. This is definitely a side. Uh, they 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 want to be the adopters of something where, like every idea that is adopted, uh, must be good by default. Well, yeah. A bunch of people uh, have apple products and now apple is one of the greatest worldwide fucking sensors in the world you know, uh, the most living people on earth like i think it's most people how many people are on earth like what seven probably seven bill at this point okay so when i was billion. growing up it was six billion but at this point come on there's like billions of people on facebook yeah like facebook has made the world worse uh like it like uh, like you look at Facebook versus Twitter. Twitter is not the place you go to like do a lynching or uh, organize your militia or uh, in the case of Myanmar, do a genocide. You don't do that on Twitter. You go to Facebook to do that. Uh, you go to Facebook to you know it, it like like anti porn uh, crusaders fucking constantly harp on porn sites biggest purveyor of child porn in the world facebook facebook right. closed groups uh like large-scale adoption of something does not make it like inherently good so right that's the thing like honestly if i if i get super caked up does nothing but money i will i will be the contrarian and just get the best cable package i can by joe hell yeah and they have video on demand on that, which is fucking streaming. <laughs> you yeah. have the options. Yeah. I mean, listen, cable companies aren't good, but I do miss channel surfing sometimes. I, I, I was a I, big I, surfer. Yeah. I want to see. I want to see. I, was, I loved flipping through 80 different things. And I know I, if, like doing that on YouTube is just not the same at all. Doesn't not even close. Yeah. Terrible, I terrible experience. <laughs> I checked Newsmax TV the other day, and it's like, it it looks like, like, it's hard to describe it. It basically comes off with the tone of, uh, of, uh, like, what are those, what are those, uh, those channels, or not those channels, what are those local weird-ass TV stations that aren't affiliates? That aren't NBC. affiliates, so just yeah. public access networks. Public access. Newsmax yeah. is like public access on cable. Yeah. Just production values are so dog shit that it's like so many dudes just streaming from their house, even before COVID. Well, that's the other thing. Awful. Yeah. All television is easier to make these days, which means it all it, it, most of it will look shittier if it's not being made by people that are experienced. God, that would be wonderful. Yeah. Uh, all right. But uh, we can probably. Yeah, Probably that's kind like of my journey. 
Um, I know Ruben said he had some questions for the both of us. Yeah, for real. Yeah, what's up? All right. Yeah, I think we are. Um, so it was nice hearing about the catch up in the last decade plus our lives together. Mm-hmm. Um, let's see. So, um, with my experience being so different uh, about jobs uh, than all of you, much closer to Jake's. I mean, more or less, it's it's maybe like half and half uh, with Michelle, and then probably ninety nine percent with Jake. Probably ninety five. Pretty close uh, existence we've had. Mm-hmm. Um, so I wanted to just throw out some general, uh, just like, mm, uh, for lack of a better term, vibe checks about how work, uh, how your feelings and emotions are at work, uh, what what's going on on the inside. Uh, so mm-hmm. uh, as a jobber myself, um, I never sold anything that I've worked on. That's what I'm saying there. I've just worked nine to fives uh, since I was, um, yeah, I believe I just turned... 18 uh so just like fresh out of school uh just nine to fives uh, random jobs whatever else but as a job or a common thought occurrence i have typically that leads up to me quitting a job uh would just be feeling uh just bulldozed and crushed in that like this job goes nowhere and yep when you two were feeling that uh what do you think happens what happens next for you let's start with Mm. whoever reacts first facially it oh, you mean like, do you mean like in the past? Yeah. What has happened when just, we felt uh, that way? When, when you've just had a, just a big downturn, uh, the, and yeah. the job's just weighing on you. Uh, yeah. You know, what is the comeuppance? What's your next course of action? Just what, whatever first comes to mind, what is your, your so, process there? I could talk a little bit about that. Jake, I have start. a lot of experience with self-destruction. Yeah, let's start with Jake. Uh, hey, Jake. Here's the thing. Uh, what is the best way to put this? Okay, I am a big user of marijuana, right? We, <laughs> no. we can we can establish oh this. No way. No. What? Um, now what? the way that coincides with work is that what marijuana sometimes does is I'm being very careful about my words here uh, is alleviates certain feelings of of uh, despondence, uh, boredom, of uh, not enjoying where you where you are at any given moment. Mm-hmm. So. One can imagine how that might have played into uh, into my previous jobs that I didn't have, that I didn't like. Um, that said, I would say the two biggest experiences I've had with that kind of feeling in a job, because, you know, at the end of the day, like, I've had those, I've had that, like, no kitchen job I've had has, 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 has been a go-anywhere type of job. But what it did have was kind of the self-satisfaction of, of being relatively in charge of, of my own shit during any of those gigs, like as a cook, and then um, being just like like accomplishing actual labor, like giving people food, you know, like like doing something that at the end of the day, even if I don't think this job's going anywhere, I would actually feel a thousand times better getting off a cooking shift than I would getting off of an Amazon seller support shift, right? I feel that. Um, mm. But getting off the Amazon seller support shifts kind of just you kind of just go home you want to get really high you spend the rest of your evening doing stuff because you feel like you threw your whole day away so you're you're very you're not even selfishly you're just your natural my natural reaction is like no i'm gonna play video games till late at night and then the next day you wake up boom you don't want to fucking go to work you're already like dragging against the alarm so you go to work late you fail to call in to use your stuff on time you get fired that's that's how i react to that kind of stuff like yeah, yeah. if i don't if i truly not enjoy myself at a job it's usually pretty hard for me to get my shit together over a large, over a long period of time. I can, I can keep my shit together in little tracks, you know, and it usually keep going pretty well. Um, but over the course of a long arc, I will likely stop caring, and someone will talk to me about it, and someone will give me a warning, and I will pretend to care about that warning. And then as soon as things go back to normal, I will stop caring about that warning, and then uh, the cycle will repeat itself. Um, uh... Now, getting, getting out of that, Mm. has been more of an experience in figuring out what I do want to do. And more recently, even when I had a job that I wasn't necessarily stoked on, um, I was in an environment where I had a lot of autonomy, and I appreciated the shit out of that. Mm. Um, I, yeah, I wasn't harassed or hassled by anyone uh, in, my, in my most recent gig, like as far as like upper management or anything like that. So even though it wasn't the most satisfying work, I was able to just like at the end of the day be like, you know what? Got it pretty good right here. Um, and then when I got laid off for that, now I have to go back to school. And motivating through that, maybe that's going to be a big journey. We'll fucking see. 
Uh, uh, I'd say uh, substance abuse. Um, <laughs> yeah. Hell uh, yeah. Straight in. Oh, yeah. No, it got so bad. I wouldn't say I was an alcoholic at the time, but basically, did I have a chemical dependence on alcohol? You bet. DTs and everything. I threw up bile. I uh, was the worst possible version of myself. I was going through a lot at the time, but basically, I either do that or I just uh, dust myself off uh, and look for something new and uh, find something. I've been pretty blessed in my life, and uh, I kind of leverage uh, interpersonal context, uh, try to get the best possible outcome. So it always helps to know a guy. My life has been a weird revolving sequence of knowing various types of guy and uh, getting by in the skin of my teeth through luck, guile, personal ruthlessness, and uh, survival. I'm nothing else if not a survivor. So, yeah, like, because, yeah, I, I, I didn't actually, like, lose a lot of jobs, but, like, doing factory work, it's fucking miserable. And, you know, do I believe in worker solidarity and union solidarity? Sure. Uh, do I fucking like most of the people I've worked with in factories? Fuck no. Usually the one guy you can talk to is, like, the one guy you can talk to in the sense that, like, you have the one person you could talk to in high school unless you're, like, big on everyone. Like, you're just a super social, social butterfly. F factory stuff is, like, there's maybe one guy that isn't going to talk to you about fucking family guy or, uh, like, showing you a bunch of Reddit memes and shit. Where you, memes. you don't want to blow out your fucking brains. Hey, call centers. Hey, are, hey look at these titties on my phone. <laughs> hey, check out these titties. Pussy looks like a bat. Check, check this. Check this out, son. That's that's not photoshopped. Let me text nah, you. It's not a filter. It's not a filter. Oh God, this is my girlfriend. Check it out. That's her yeah. pussy. Cool, like, man. Cool, man. What's that? I've never seen a vagina. I've never had sex. I, 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 I definitely think you're cool now. Jesus Christ! Yeah, I don't, yeah. Think I, I don't have I don't, I don't have the heart to tell you. I, if there's a gender, I I fucked it. I <laughs> fucked so many people. It's terrible. Please God, get this away from down. me. Get the holes away. <laughs> put, put the dick down. But yeah, uh, it's yeah, yeah, yeah. Keep going, man. What, what else do you want to know? Uh, so that's more of a. That's more of a plan of action situation that we discussed there. So um, mm. when, uh, when similar issues are setting in outside of drug abuse, uh, on the inside, uh, what oh, do yeah. you feel first? What is your first primal instinct that kicks in? For me, I would say it's uh, an immediate depression that would make me uh, need to leave a job and drop all responsibility. And usually I'm pretty good about just having something ready to go next. Um, but once usually a job's backseated, uh, you know, it's in the rear view as they slowly want to start talking to me about my work performance. And I am spending all my breaks and all call time I'm not being looked at to uh, look for jobs on my phone. Uh, oh, so how yeah. would you both, uh, what is your re first reaction uh, to, um, you know, getting getting job down? I, um... Oh, wait, wait, you you're talking internally, before? not, not You're like... a feel, what is your feel? Oh, oh yeah. wow, that's that's like uh, I mean, first that's, sim that's simple. I'm like it's kind of like taking a shit. It's like, well, I don't have to be in that fucking place anymore. It's a I'm job. Yeah. If it no, no, if it's a job, uh I feel a million times more personally satisfied career shit-wise. I will put myself there. A job is like they had something to offer me, like, <laughs> like I need to be there. I don't want to be there. Wait. 
Like, they, they think that's the principal difference and contradictory part of job versus, like, career. It's like, uh... Becomes a fuck that job, fuck this job situation. Yeah, like, and you won't be great at your career always, and you'll have to say, well, I'm fucking out of here because I suck at this now or I don't get what I want. <gasps> one Scott, and I think, you know, Jake, you could probably attest to that, like... Yeah. Like, so, for me... I know it's beyond the sunk cost fallacy because I have something to say. Uh, it has taken a lot for me, but also, like, I never would have experienced what I had gotten to and, like, introduced the people that I did to one another. And, uh, yeah, but job-wise, yeah, no, it's like taking a shit. It's like, well, that's done. Yeah. I don't... I I don't. I don't sit around and think about jobs that I had in the past. No, I mean, I think what Ruben is asking. I think what Ruben is asking is more like when you realize you hate a job. Like, where's that? Where's that put you? Right. Put uh, Michelle at feeling like mentally. Take a shit. And yeah, I mean, my feeling yeah. is usually like my feeling is usually Release. less like. Release. I'll be honest. Like, I'm usually less of the how can I get out of this, and then more of the how can I make this easier for myself at first, anyway. Right. Like. I'm pretty good at, at lining up any job I have to be pretty um, minimum effort if it's uh, if it's a, if it's a, like a nine to five ish type gig. If it's not something that is like actually requires you to be <laughs> like in a production, you kind of have to be just like ready to rock for a bunch of different things at any time. There's a lot of unpredictability, but in predictable jobs, my experience is it's very easy for me to make them pretty light work. And uh, if I'm experiencing that, like just like oh, I actually have to get out of here. Usually, instead of looking for jobs, I will look around at what my friends are doing or where my friends are working. Um, I'm, I guess, I am more of a networking person than I am a like trying. Most jobs I have gotten have been from someone I know, knowing someone somewhere, um, right. and not just like cold applying or or trying to get my foot in the door in a place. Um, Which, by the way, hold on one second. Definitely do that. Don't do what I fucking do. <laughs> please go through all of your friends, their friends and family, get yeah. jobs. People hand you. Everyone's much nicer to you it's, that way. I, it's, I swear to God, it's like it, knowing it's, a guy, you just know have to guy. say anyone. I know this person who worked here. They're a cool person. And that's like, that's, that's, that'll open doors sometimes, you know, uh, for sure. And, and it's not absolutely. like I haven't also called applied to jobs. It's just that the success rate for when I get a job usually has to do with, uh, someone I know being some type, some type of an in, even if it's just, hey, I sent an email uh, to my like hiring manager about you or something like that. Um, that that little bit does help. Uh, but yeah, I, I will do those types of things or try to put out feelings. But I'm I'm like you know like I said like I'm I got fired from my job I didn't like. I didn't find another job at first. I got put on my butt and then immediately had to find another gig. That's how I went back to cooking at a bar. Um, it was more of a opportunity that came out of my situation than it was anything that I tried to get, yeah. um, which is, I guess, how I tend to roll with with that kind of stuff in my experience. So, mm -hmm. mm. It's a pretty oh, decent yeah. success rate. Uh, right. Yeah, like right, it was literally like, oh, I got fired, and then I was like, mm. hey, everyone, I got fired, and then within a week or two, my friend was like, hey, the place I'm at is is hiring for cooks, and I was like, okay, <laughs> and then I just walked over there, mm. um, shit like that. Uh, okay. Let's see. We well, got about two more questions here. Uh, third oh, being, boy. favorite jobber moments. Uh, you don't like the guy from Family Guy talking to you. You don't like working in an office and hearing people bitch about non-existent problems on the phone. Um, I'll th run through one of my small uh, favorite jobber moments. Was um, was this two jobs ago? Uh, it's call center for benefits and. Um, outside of open enrollment which happens once a year for about a less than a month uh we had one call per day per employee it's a whole call floor we all get trained and then you wait eight months taking one call a day until it's showtime for open enrollment um and my desk friend wait, open desk enrollment person, you like got people enrolled in like their benefits what? so just health benefits. dental yeah. I just handled all manner of their benefits, had access to like an encyclopedia that tells me every company's specific benefits when you call in, 
and to resolve benefit issues because someone tells you they can't give you teeth and they're, and you're like why and they're like talk to your job then I, you would call me because I would be like you're talking you're calling the wrong person or your date of birth was wrong so I updated it and then go tell them fuck off um, or resolving chain of command issues with how to get paid for your insurance which is really stupid but no one knows what to do except for a secondary call center you have to hire if you don't have them that's you have to google it yourself so we were like a high touch white glove call center uh that was uh we were a luxury service of you have no problems if something comes up don't talk to anyone i do it i do it for you uh so my my desk mate uh lily uh she was a nice uh 50 year old woman uh who had tenure at that company uh, moved in from oregon and uh we just played i i first learned uh about bought a book on card games learned most card games from gin poker uh multiple types of solitaire and then we spent the better part of a year playing cards non-stop every day and just talking about her family and um how much uh how semi-religious she is and how good she is at gambling uh she was very cool it was a very archer ruth kind of moment of him at the cancer ward talking to Ruth and she's dope. Uh, that was, I like that. That was the coolest oh, wow. year old I ever met. It was just every day. Yo, How's was, it going? Let's play these cards. I always wondered what your card game origin was. That was the card game origin was I was bored Stop. at work and I was like, oh, well, you can't you can't play solitaire on the computer at this job. It's an important information computer job. Um, so your computer did have solitaire on it. So I was like, oh, I could play it in person though. And then, right. Um, <laughs> Uh, we just we played a ton of our games, made up games. Um, cactus Golf is very good. Go to got.com if you want to learn how to play Cactus Golf. Um, I also taught her Mahjong and Chess 2. Um, God oh damn it. God. She was just so fucking good at cards. If you find an old gambler person, you saddle yeah. up, buy them a drink. It's so There's so much good knowledge coming off of them. She tells, no, me yeah, how that she, owns. she tells me how she wins several hundred dollars. She goes and plays ni- nickel slots for like... 30 bucks a month and comes out like a thousand dollars every month and just that cash is. and she's just fucking throwing fliff uh she was so cool i really hope this pandemic ends soon i want to make sure she's okay nice mm-hmm. nice that owns yeah no i've had a lot of good work experiences with coworkers and stuff like that um you know like i said like uh i'm still very happy to be friends with a bunch of the people i met working at adult swim so every time i go back to atlanta it's just a nice to to kind of get to hang out with them and catch up um i've actually met you know in, in each job i've worked i've probably met at least one person that i conti- that i continue to to kind of keep up with at least a little bit right um very cool guy at my old amazon gig cj who you know on every on every single break we would be at the dog park across the street um nice. getting high. <laughs> nice nice just hanging out spending like making the most of that 15 minutes um and uh chilling and like that was just you know that was like one of those things where i was like yeah like those were the rock parts of my day kind of got me through it um and then uh you know even at my most recent gig where i was working for this startup it was you know it was cool but it was it had a lot of very silly startup issues but everyone who worked there in a just um on hire capacity who wasn't part of the leadership like very cool chill person enjoyable to talk around with i used to be on a radio <coughs> with like four or five of the same people for the the majority of my day because we're all working this live broadcast together. So it was literally like a Discord call. Like imagine if you're doing your job and you're also in a Discord call with everyone else who is doing their job oh, at yeah. the same time. Like it was like half, the, like half the time we were working, but the rest of the time we're literally just bullshitting with each other and talking about bullshit like while the broadcast is going successfully. Like as long as everything's going smooth, we don't have to do, we like, there's, you know, no one has to do a lot of crazy shit. Um, so that was a really enjoyable experience too. It was just like, even though I didn't necessarily like the work I was doing as a production assistant at that gig, I was like always laughing and like, in a, you know, I, I was like, everyone knew I was like, uh, everyone knew the position I was in. So it's like, they were very chill about it. And like, um, yeah, I kind of miss, like I got very used to having, I would literally walk around with voices in my head and then also have to be dealing with like people face to face and like ferrying people around our studio and stuff like that. <laughs> Oh, so, so you're, you were the person wearing one of those, like, headsets indoors yeah. at the studio. Yes. Oh, that's yes. what those are for. Mm. That's, I mean, it, yeah, you know, like, on a television set, when you see a producer who's wearing a headset, 
they are wired into whoever else in that in their, that production their is, squad. is is you know, like a director and like a, a bunch of other people like several PAs all that stuff yeah um, shortwave radio is a huge part of, of operation during those productions mm. um, it's kind of funny that's uh, cool yeah no, uh, it was neat I think I think for me um, in terms of jobs. Let's say job-wise, if we picked more from the career side of it, because job-wise, as I said, most of my jobs uh, were not really... It was there for the money. Uh, yeah, sure. Pretty, pretty shit most of the time. Yeah, like, are we all? In, ter- in terms of that, it's, it's not like a classist or elitist thing, because I'm making the same money they are. Uh, in my given career, it was where, I don't know, I had something to talk to, about with uh, some of the people probably my best I, I think you know my best experiences on that front were I think the the best uh, I think the two people I've known uh, like as it relates to writing specifically and not more jack of all trades people like say Eliza or whatever the people I the two people I've known longest outside of Carl would be uh, Lana Polanski and Samantha Allen, uh, who have been uh, great people I've talked to over the years, no matter what, uh, when I've been able to find and speak with them. It's been a good time. Um, just, just, uh, just because, you know... Those two people have helped me, like, think of things outside of my very specific worldview, uh, where if you've known me, it's real hard to change uh, how I feel about something, because I have very strong feelings about things. Uh, So if I take the time to consider the thoughts of those people, like... You know, that's that's good in terms of experiences. You know, as a freelancer, uh, you're just always kind of crossing. You're just like other. You're just like a shit ton of passing ships. You know, it's cool when you do get to meet and befriend people uh, in your specific field. But I've made friends in like other other fields specifically. Uh, now. Now, uh, I, I think my best experiences have just been, like, at at the, the one awards show slash subsequent panel we had. I, I, I got to speak to an older author who wrote on the subject of private gun ownership and a history of it. And it was fascinating. And I basically, I wasn't trying to freak her out, but I was like, have you ever heard of the Call of Duty franchise of video games? Yeah. But I think it would terrify you specifically because you, you the, the guns are ornate and decorated in the way one would a car. And they're all colorful and candy colored. And uh, she's just like, no, that sounds awful. And I was like, oh, you bet it is. <laughs> I feel like I've played so many of them. I mean... Obviously, I think she can, like, separate the two, but uh, that was an excellent conversation to have. And the driver was, like, this generalized Mediterranean accent that I couldn't quite place. But he was like, so you you, you think uh, you can't, like, own your own gun, huh? Is that, it? Is that what this is about when you write about this? I think, you know, in the Second Amendment, they say we have this. What if the British come? I was like, "All right, man. Uh, there's that. What if the what if the Redcoats come with their fucking muskets and firing line style tactics? Then yeah, I'm gonna call the guy with the Glock. But until that day, like, it doesn't look like that's coming up anytime soon. <laughs> I mean, if anything, it's gonna be some hillbilly with that fucking perception of things. I don't know either." nailing you in a mass shooting or uh, in some militia-style pogroms. Who can say? Uh, But yeah, the panel was amazing. Uh, 
you know, talking to people, laughing. Uh, there were, it, it was, it was, it was weird because I, uh, I had appealed, I had, I had sort of repelled the people that were like sort of my bread and butter and weirdly enough, like the weird rah-rah military guys responded really well to me for whatever reason because i probably cursed a lot uh but yeah that that that's probably the most fun i had like being me and my career path the actual award ceremony itself was again like release i didn't win and like i was able to sleep afterwards after that i didn't like go to bed until like 3 a.m every night until it was over uh, like, there's, you don't even want to be stressed out by it, but, like, it can affect your sales and potentially be very good for you. Sure. And that is a thing that you can't control in your brain. Yeah, uh, that's, that's wild. Uh, and, uh, well, this is a, uh, this is the end of part one. No, uh, no monologue here. No, no self, uh, no self-indulgent, uh, monologue, which, just, just you life. know, that's life, baby. That's life, uh, it's not saying by, by, uh, Frank Sinatra, is it? Uh, no, he said that's life. He said that's life? It's what the people are saying. And then, then Yaquim Phoenix pulls out the gun and he says, and now you get what you fucking deserve. And it's like, Pow! and then blood just splashes. And, uh, you know, people Robert said De Niro's it was dead. Robert De Niro's dead now. To I'm now? Michelle Perez. <laughs> when? Uh, I'm Michelle Perez. Oh, no, Robert uh, De Niro's dead. As <laughs> always, I'm joined by my buddy, Jake Rubin, and uh, erstwhile buddy, Eliza. You've been listening to Work It On It. I love you but you will never know me. <laughs>